Hello my dear friends, welcome to this channel. Um, this is the channel that we called um, Library. I am Van Hofstadter and um, I'm not an in a native English speaker, but um, when I was young, I always dreamed to read classic books. But because of financial situation growing up, I never had a chance to read, to read classic books. And now I'm reading this online so I could share my classic books to other people, the young readers who would love to read these books, but for one reason or another, uh, can't simply afford to buy one. So this is a free reading. And if you know someone who would be also interested, please share these videos. This is for non-speakers, non-English speakers, I mean, and um, maybe also from um, English-speaking countries, but never had an experience to read a classic book. Today, and the days after today, later on, we are going to read the book of Persuasion. It is a book by Jane Austen. And Jane Austen uh, was born in 1775 and died in 1817. She was an English novelist, author, known primarily for her six novels, which implicitly interpret, critic, and comment upon the British landed gentry at the end of the 18th century. And this book, Persuasion, was actually published posthumously in 1818. So, but well, if you are new to classic books, you might have um, difficulty following some sentences, but if you continue, believe me, you will get, get the grasp up of it and you will understand it fully. And if you do have any other questions, Please leave your questions and comments below and I will try as much as I can to answer whatever it will be. So let's start Persuasion by Jane Austen, Chapter 1. Sir Walter Elliot of Killinch Hall in Somersetshire was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book but the baronetage. There he found occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one. There his faculties were roast into admiration and respect by contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest patterns. There, any unwelcome sensations arising from domestic affairs changed naturally into pity and contempt. As it turned over, the almost endless creations of the last century and there, if every other leaf were powerless, he could read it, read his own history with an interest which never failed. This was the page at which the favorite volume always opened. Eliot of Killinch Hall Walter Elliot, born March 1, 1760, married July 15, 1784. Elizabeth, daughter of James Stevenson, Esquire of South Park in the county of Gloucester. 
by which lady who died 1800 he has issue elizabeth born june 1 1785 anne born august 9 1787 a stillborn son, November 5, 1789. Mary, born November 20, 1791. Precisely such as the paragraph originally stood from the printer's hands, but Sir Walter had improved it by adding for the information of himself and his family these words after the date of Mary's birth married December 16 1810 Charles son and heir of Charles Musgrove Esquire of Uppercross in the county of Somerset, and by inserting most accurately the day of the month on which he had lost his wife. Then followed the history and the rise of the ancient and respectable family in the usual terms. How it had been first settled in Cheshire. He how mentioned in Dogdale, serving the office of High Sheriff. Representing a borough in three successive parliaments, exertions of loyalty and dignity of baronet. In the first year of Charles the Second, with all the Marys and Elizabeths, they had married, forming all together two handsome duosimo pages, and concluding with the arms and motto. Principal seat, Kellynch Hall, in the county of Somerset, and Sir. Walter's handwriting again in this finale. Our presumptive William Walter Elliot Esquire, great grandson of the second Sir Walter. Vanity was the beginning, an end of Sir Walter Elliot's character. Vanity of person and of situation. He had been remarkably handsome in his youth, and at 54 was still a very fine man. Few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did, nor could the valet of any new maid lord be more delighted with the place he held in society. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of baronetcy. And Sir Walter Elliot, who united these gifts, was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. His good looks and his rank had one fair claim on his attachment, since to them he must have owed a wife of very superior character to anything deserved by his own. Lady Elliot had been an excellent woman, sensible and amiable whose judgment and conduct, if they might be pardoned, 
the youthful infatuation which made her Lady Elliot has never required indulgence afterwards. She had humored or softened or concealed his failings and promoted his real respectability for 17 years. And though not the very happiest being in the world herself, had found enough in her duties, her friends, and her children to attach her to life and make it no matter of indifference to her when she was called on to quit them. Three girls, the two eldest, 16 and 14, was an awful legacy for a mother to bequest. An awful charge, rather, to confide to the authority and guidance of a conceited, silly father. She had, however, one very intimate friend, a sensible, deserving woman, who had been brought by strong attachment to herself to settle close by her in the village of Killinged, and on her kindness and advice, Lady Elliot mainly relied for the best help and maintenance of the good principles and instruction which she had been anxiously giving her daughters. This friend and Sir Walter did not marry whatever might have been anticipated on that head of their acquaintance. Thirteen years had passed away since Lady Elliot's death, and they were still near neighbors and intimate friends, and one remained a widower, the other a widow. That Lady Russell of steady age and character and extremely well provided for should have no thought of a second marriage needs no apology to the public which is rather apt to be unreasonably discontented when a woman does marry again than when she does not but sir walter's continuing in singleness requires explanation be it known then that Sir Walter, like a good father, having met with one or two private disappointments in very unreasonable applications, prided himself on remaining single for his dear daughter's sake. For one daughter, his eldest, he would really have given up anything which he had not been very much tempted to do. Elizabeth had succeeded, at sixteen, to all that was possible of her mother's rights and consequence, and being very handsome and very like himself, her influence had always been great, and they had gone on together most happily. His two other children were of very inferior value. Mary had acquired a little artificial importance by becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove. But Anne, with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character, which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding, was nobody with either father or sister. Her word had no weight. 
Her convenience was always to keep away. She was only Anne. To Lady Russell's, indeed, she was a most dear and highly valued goddaughter, favorite and friend. Lady Russell loved them all, but it was only in Anne that she could fancy a mother to revive again. A few years before, Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early, and as even in its height, her father had found little to admire in her. So totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. There could be nothing in them now that she was faded and thin to excite his esteem. He had never indulged much hope he had now none of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. All equality of alliance must rest with Elizabeth, for Mary had merely connected herself with an old country family of respectability and large fortune, and had therefore given old honor and received none. Elizabeth would one day or other marry suitably. It sometimes happens that a woman is handsomer at 29 than she was 10 years before. And generally speaking, if there has been neither ill health nor anxiety, it is a time of life at which scarcely any charm is lost. It was so with Elizabeth, still the same handsome Miss Elliot that she had begun to be thirteen years ago, and Sir Walter might be excused, therefore, in forgetting her age, or at least be deemed only half a fool for thinking himself and Elizabeth as blooming as ever. Amidst the wreck of the good looks of everybody else, for he could plainly see how old all the rest of his family and acquaintance were growing. Anne Hoggard, Mary Corst, every face in the neighborhood worsting. And the rapid increase of the cow's crow's foot about Lady Russell's temples had long been a distress to him. Elizabeth did not quite equal her father in personal contentment. Thirteen years had seen her mistress of Killinch Hall, presiding and directing with a self-possession and decision which could never have given the idea of her being younger than she was. For thirteen years had she been doing the honors and laying down the domestic law at home, and leading the way to the chase and forth, and walking immediately after Lady Russell's out of all the drawing rooms and dining rooms in the country. Thirteen winters, revolving frost, had seen her opening 
every bowl of credit which a scantry neighborhood afforded, and thirteen springs shone their blossoms as she traveled up to London with her father for a few weeks annual enjoyment of the great world. She had the remembrance of all this. She had the consciousness of being nine and twenty. To give her some regrets and some apprehensions, she was fully satisfied of being still quite as handsome as ever. But she felt her approach to the years of danger and would have rejoiced to be certain of being properly solicited by baronet blood within the next twelve month or two. Then might she again take up the books of books with as much enjoyment as in her early youth, but now she liked it not, always to be presented with the date of her own birth, and she know and see no marriage follow, but what but that of a youngest sister made the book an evil, and more than once, when her father had left it open on the table near her, had she closed it with averted eyes and pushed it away. She had had a disappointment, moreover, which that book, and especially the history of her own family must ever present the remembrance of. The R presented the very William Walter Elliot Esquire, whose rights had been so generously supported by her father, had disappointed her. She had while a very young girl, as soon as she had known him to be, in the event of her having no brother, the future baronet meant to marry him. And her father had always meant that she should. He had not been known to them as a boy. But soon after Lady Eliot's death, Sir Walter had sought the acquaintance, and though his overtures had not been met with any warmth, he had persevered in seeking it, making allowance for the modest drawing back of youth, and in one of the spring excursions to London, when Elizabeth was in her first bloom, Mr. Elliot had been forced into the introduction. He was at the time a very young man, just engaged in the study of the law, and Elizabeth found him extremely agreeable, and Every plan in his favor was confirmed. He was invited to Killinch Hall. He was talked of and expected all the rest of the year. But he never came. The following spring, he was seen again in town. Found equally agreeable again encouraged, invited, and expected, and again he did not come. And the next tidings were that he was married. 
instead of pushing his fortune in the line marked out for the heir of the house of Elliot, he had purchased independence by uniting himself to a rich woman of inferior birth. Sir Walter had resented it. As the head of the house, he felt that he ought to have been consulted, especially after taking the young man so publicly by the hand, for they must have been seen together, he observed. Once at Tattersall, and twice in the lobby of the House of Commons. His disapprobation was expressed, but apparently very little regarded. Mr. Elliot had attempted no apology and shown himself as unsolicitous of being longer noticed by the family as sir walter considered him unworthy of it all acquaintance between them had ceased this very awkward history of mr elliot was still after an interval of several years felt with anger by elizabeth who had liked the man for himself, and still more for being her father's hire, and whose strong family pride could see only in him a proper match for Sir Walter Elliot's oldest daughter. There was not a baronet from A to Z, whom her feelings could have so willingly acknowledge as an equal, yet so miserably had he conducted himself that though she was at this present time, summer of 1814, wearing black ribbons for his wife, she could not admit him to be worth thinking of again. The disgrace of his first marriage might perhaps, as there was no reason to suppose it perpetuated by offspring, have been, have been cut over, had he not done worse. But he had, as by the customary intervention of kind friends, they had been informed spoken most disrespectfully of them all, most slightingly and contemptuously of the very blood he belonged to, and the honours which were hereafter to be his own. This could not be pardoned. Such were Elizabeth Elliot's sentiments and sensations, such the cares to alloy, the agitations to vary, the sameness and the elegance, the prosperity and the nothingness of her scene of life, such the feelings to give interest to a long and eventful residence. In one country circle, to fill the vacancies, which there were no habits of utility abroad, no talents or accomplishments for home to occupy. But now, another occupation and solicitude of mine was beginning to be added to this. Her father was growing distressed for money. She knew that when he now took up 
the baronetage. It was to drive the heavy bills of his tradespeople and the unwelcome hints of Mr. Shepherd, his agent, from his thoughts. The Killing's property was good, but not equal to Sir Walter's apprehension of the state required in its possessor. While Lady Elliot's leave, there had been method, moderacy, moderation, and economy, which had just kept him within his income. But with her had died all such right mindedness, and from that period he had been constantly exceeding it. It had not been possible for him to spend less. He had done nothing but what Sir Walter Elliot was imperiously called on to do. But, blameless as he was, he was not only growing dreadfully in debt, but was hearing of it so often that it had become vain to attempt concealing it longer, even partially from his daughter. He had given her some hints of it the last spring in town. He had gone so far even as to say, can we retrench? Does it occur to you that there is any one article in which we can retrench? And Elizabeth, to do her justice, had in the first ardor of female alarm said seriously to think what could be done, and had finally proposed these two branches of economy to cut off some unnecessary charities and to refrain from new furnishing the new, the living the drawing room to which expedients afterwards added the happy thought of their taking no present down to Anne, as had been the usual yearly custom. But these measures, however, good in themselves, were insufficient for the real extent of the evil, the whole of which Sir Walter found himself obliged to confess to her soon afterwards. Elizabeth had nothing to pro propose of deeper efficacy. She felt herself ill-used and unfortunate as did her father, and they were neither of them able to devise any means of lessening their expenses without compromising their dignity or relinquishing their comforts in a way not to be borne. There was only a small part of his estate that Sir Walter could dispose of, but had every acre been alienable, it would have made no difference. He had condescended to mortgage as far as he had the power, but he would never condescend to sell. No, he would never disgrace his name so far. The Kellynch estate should be transmitted whole and entire as he had received it. Their two confidential friends, Mr. Shefford, who lived in the neighboring market town, and Lady Russell, were called on to advise them and both father and daughter seemed to expect that something 
should be struck out by one or the other to remove their embarrassments and reduce their expenditure without involving the loss of any indulgence of taste or pride. That was the end of chapter one. And I hope you enjoyed this one, the chapter. And now I am trying to continue to chapter two. Chapter two, Preservation by Jane Austen. Mr. Shepard, a civil, cautious lawyer, who, whatever might be his hold or his views on Sir Walter, would rather have the disagreeable prompted by anybody else, excused himself from offering the slightest hint and only begged leave to recommend an implicit difference to the excellent judgment of Lady Russell. From whose known good sense, he fully expected to have just such resolute measures advised as he meant to see finally adopted. Lady Russell was most anxiously zealous on the subject and gave it much serious consideration. She was a woman rather of sound than of quick abilities, whose difficulties in coming to any decision in this instance were great, from the opposition of two leading principles. She was of strict integrity herself, with a delicate sense of honor, but she was as desirous of saving Sir Walter's feelings as solicitous for the credit of the family, as aristocratic in his ideas of what was due to them, as anybody of sense and honesty could well be. She was a benevolent, charitable, good woman, and capable of strong attachments, most correct in her conduct, strict in her notions of decorum, and with manners that were held a standard of good breeding. She had a cultivated mind, and was, generally speaking, rational and consistent, but she had prejudices on the side of ancestry. She had a value for rank and consequence, which blinded her a little to the faults of those who possessed them. Herself, the widow of only a knight, she gave the dignity of a baronet all its due, and Sir Walter, independent of his claims, as an old acquaintance, an attentive neighbor, an obliging landlord, the husband of her very dear friend, the father of Anne, and her sisters, was as being Sir Walter, in her apprehension, entitled to a great deal of compassion and consideration under his present difficulties. They must retrench. That did not admit of a doubt, but she was very anxious to have it done with the least possible pain to him and Elizabeth. She drew up plans of economy. She made exact calculations, and she did what nobody else thought of doing. She consulted Anne, who, 
never seemed considered by the others as having any interest in the question. She consulted in a degree was influenced by her in making out the scheme of retrenchment, which was at last submitted to Sir Walter. Every emendation of Anne's had been on the side of honesty against importance. She wanted more vigorous measures, a more complete reformation, a quicker release from death, a much higher tone of indifference for everything but justice and equity. If we can persuade your father to all this, said Lady Russell, looking over her paper, much may be done. If he will adopt these regulations, in seven years he will be clear, and I hope we may be able to convince him and Elizabeth that Killinch Hall has a respectability in its help, which cannot be affected by these reductions, and that the true dignity of Sir Walter Elliot will be very far from lessened in the eyes of sensible people by his acting like a man of principle. What will be what will he be doing, in fact, but what very many of our first families have done or ought to do? There will be nothing singular in his case, and it is singularity which often makes the worst part of our suffering, as it always does of our conduct. I have great hope of our prevailing. We must be serious and decided. For, after all, the person who has contracted debts must pay them. And though a great deal is due to the feelings of the gentleman and the head of a house, like your father, there is still more due to the character of an honest man. This was the principle on which Anne wanted her father to be proceeding, his friends to be urging him. She considered it as an act of indispensable duty to clear away the claims of creditors with all the expedition which the most comprehensive retrenchments could secure, and so no dignity in anything short of it. She wanted it to be prescribed and felt as a duty. She rated Lady Russell's influence highly. And as to the severe degree of self-denial, which her own consequence prompted, she believed there might be little more difficulty in persuading them to a complete than to a half reformation. Her knowledge of her father and Elizabeth inclined her to think that the sacrifice of one pair of horses would be hardly less painful than of both, and so on. Through the whole list of Lady Russell's two gentle reductions, how ants more rigid requisitions might have been taken is of little consequence. 
Lady Russell's had no success at all. Could not be put up with. Were not to be born. What? Every comfort of life knock off? Journeys, London, servants, horses, table, contractions and restrictions everywhere? To live no longer with the decencies even of a private gentleman. No, he would sooner quit Killing Hall at once than remain in it on such disgraceful terms. Quit Killing Hall. The hint was immediately taken up by Mr. Shepherd, whose interest was involved in the reality of Sir Walter's retrenching and who was perfectly persuaded that nothing could be done without a change of a boat. Since the idea had been started in the very quarter which ought to dictate, he had no scruple, he said, in confessing his judgment to be entirely on that side. It did not appear to him that Sir Walter could materially alter his style of living in a house which had such character of hospitality and ancient dignity to support. In any other place, Sir Walter might judge for himself and would be looked up to as regulating the modest of life, the modes of life, in whatever way he might choose to model his household. Sir Walter would quit Killinch Hall, and a very few days more of doubt and indecision, the great question of whether he should go was settled. And the first outline of his important change made out. There had been three alternatives, London, Bath, or another house in the country. All Anne's wishes had been for the latter. A small house in their own neighborhood, where they might still have Lady Russell's society, still be near Mary, and still have the pleasure of sometimes seeing the lawns and the groves of Killinch was the object of her ambition. But the usual fate of Anne attended her in having something very opposite from his from her inclination fixed on. She disliked Bath and did not think it agreed with her. And Bath was to be her home. Sir Walter had at first thought more of London, but Shepherd felt that he could not be trusted in London and had been skillful enough to dissuade him from it and make Bath preferred. It was a much safer place for a gentleman in his pretty comment he might there be important at comparatively little expense two material advantages of bath over london had of course been given all their weight it was more convenient distance from killinch only 50 miles and Lady Russell's spending some part of every winter there, and to the very great satisfaction of Lady Russell, whose first views on the projected change had been for Bath. Sir Walter and Elizabeth were induced to believe that they should lose neither consequence or enjoyment by settling there. 
Lady Russell felt obliged to oppose her dear aunt's known wishes. It would be too much to expect Sir Walter to descend into a small house in his own neighborhood. Anne herself would have found the mortifications of it more than she foresaw. And to Sir Walter's feelings, they must have been dreadful. And with regard to Anne's dislike of Bath, she considered it as a prejudice and mistake, arising first from the circumstances of her having been three years at school there, after her mother's death, and secondly, from her happening to be not in perfectly good spirits the only winter which she had afterwards spent there with herself. Lady Russell was fun of Bath, in short, and disposed to think it must suit them all, and as to her young friend's health, by passing all the warm months with her at Killinch Lodge, every danger would be avoided. And it was, in fact, a change, which must do both health and spirits good. Anne had been too little from home, too little seen. Her spirits were not high. A larger society would improve them. She wanted her to be more known. The undesirableness of any other house in the same neighborhood for sale water was certainly much strengthened by one part, and a very material part of the scheme, which had been happily engrafted on the beginning. He was not only to quit his home, but to see in it hands of others, a trial of fortitude, which stronger heads than Sir Walter's have found too much. Killen's Hall was to be let. This, however, was a profound secret, not to be breathed beyond their own circle. Sir Walter could not have borne the degradation of being known to design letting his house. Mr. Shepherd had once mentioned the word advertise but never dared approach it. Again, Sir Walter spurred the idea of being offered in any manner, forbade the slightest hint being dropped off his having such an intention. And it was only on the supposition of his being spontaneously solicited by some most unexceptionable applicant on his own terms, and as a great favor that he would let it at all. How quick come the reason? reasons for approving what we like. Lady Russell had another excellent one at hand for being extremely glad that Sir Walter and his family were to remove from the country. Elizabeth had been lately forming an intimacy which she wished to see interrupted. It was with a daughter of Mr. Shepherd who had returned after an unprosperous marriage to her father's house with the additional burden of two children. 
She was a clever young woman, who understood the art of blessing, and the art of blessing at least, at Killinch Hall, and who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot, as to have been already staying there more than once, in spite of all that Lady Russell, who thought it a friendship quite out of place, could hint of caution and reserve. Lady Russell, indeed, had scarcely any influence with Elizabeth, and seemed to love her rather because she would love her than because Elizabeth deserved it. She had never received from her more than outward attention. Nothing beyond observances of complaisance had never succeeded in any point which she wanted to carry against previous inclinations. She had been repeatedly very earnest in trying to get Anne included in a visit to London, sensibly open to all the injustice and all the discredit of the selfish arrangements which shut her out and on many lesser occasions had endeavored to give Elizabeth the advantage of her own better judgment and experience, but always in vain. Elizabeth would go her own way and never had she pursued it in more decided opposition to Lady Russell than in this selection of Mrs. Clay, turning from the society of so deserving a sister to bestow her affection and confidence on one who ought to have been nothing to her but the object of distant civility. From situation, Mrs. Clay was in Lady Russell's estimate a very unequal, and in her character she believed a very dangerous companion and a removal that would leave Mrs. Clay behind and bring a choice of more suitable intimates with Miss Elliot's rich. Was therefore an object of first-rate importance. That was the end of chapter 2. Next video is from chapter 3. Then thank you very much for watching and for reading with me. And I hope to see you again in the next uh, video starting on chapter 3. If you do um, like this video, please like. And leave any comments whatever you think about this video reading with me and if you fancy it you can share it with them but i look forward again on a new on the next video from the bottom of my heart thank you very much and goodbye